Hello, I'm joined today by Steven Wilkinson. Steven has worked in finance a lot and he has helped a lot of entrepreneurs uh, build a deeper understanding about finance, accounting, and help them overcome uh, anxiety around those topics. And today I'm talking with Steve about education, the cost of education, and how education should be priced. So Steve, when we started this conversation on Twitter, where I was basically putting out the question, should education be free? And then you had a very interesting reaction to that. I think I had a visceral reaction to it. I wrote back and said, it's never free. It can't be free. You might give it away, but that doesn't mean it's free. And my thinking behind that is quite simple. If it's valuable, and if there is a process that results in the delivery of, of an educational product or service, then people have put time, effort, and money into it, and therefore it's used resources, and it can't be free if it wasn't free to produce. Now, you were asking the question, should it be free at the point of delivery? That means the costs associated with producing it have not been borne by the recipient, but they have to be borne by somebody else. And the, the use of the word free always sort of gets my hackles up because it suggests that there are no costs involved in the production and there should be no costs involved in the delivery. And those two things are entirely different. Because I'm convinced, I mean, we don't have to be, no, it doesn't, I don't think it even needs debate. There is always a cost of production. The question is, who funds it? Does the customer fund it, or the consumer, or the recipient, or does somebody else fund it? And that, at, that at the very least, is where that conversation should start. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I have a cost developing my platform, my courses, and I'm actually trying to find the best way of who should bear that cost. So my initial thinking was, if I can get a few high-end course creators, businesses on the platform, who will pay me like um, enough such that I can basically subsidize it for free personal use for students and the like. So that, that's one possible business model, but I wasn't able to make that work because I couldn't get those businesses pay, well, on the platform basically in uh, a short enough time that allowed me to bootstrap it. So maybe what's your views on the different business models that can work for education and maybe why some of them don't work? When I was growing up and probably before you were even born, there was a famous American entrepreneur called Victor Kayam. Right. And Victor Kayam was famous in England, at least, or in the UK in the 19, sort of early 1980s, I think, because he had a television commercial for um, an electric shaver. I think it was Remington Shavers. And he owned the company. He bought it in a sort of LBO or something. Anyway, he was part of the advertising. And he used the shaver and say, I love this shaver so much, I bought the company. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, thought, I, mean, I, I thought he was great. And, and I remember it you know, 40 years later. But he wrote a book. He wrote a little bio autobiography. And the autobiography starts off with his very first business venture when he was about eight, because he and his brother made lemonade with lemons that they had at home and ice water and sugar that they got from home. And they would take these big jugs and they would, he lived in Chicago and they would, on a summer afternoon, they would position themselves outside the railway station where all the commuters were coming out and try to sell them lemonade. And because there were sort of so many and it was hot and steamy and, and people were really exhausted. He said people would come and they didn't have any money. And then they would ask us whether we could have some lemonade anyway. So, you know, because we felt sorry for them, we, we gave them lemonade. As a guess what? We went bust really quickly. And he, he said, my very first business lesson was don't mix charity and business. Run the business like a business. And then what you do with the profits is entirely up to you. Then you can give them away. But you have to make money you, you, because money is what supports the business. So you can go back the next day and the next day and the next day. And you have to make a profit because you're always pre-financing things. 
You know, yeah. Profit is an arbitrary measure. It's just you know, excess over cost that you need to fund the business going forward. And I've always remembered that. And I think I read that book when I was, I don't know, 17 or 18. It's the idea of a little boy selling, giving his orange, his lemon juice away. Firstly, I thought, what shits? You know, the, the uh, people coming off the train taking lemonade of two young kids. <laughs> how, how despicable do you have to be to do that and then not give them any money? But that's informed my thinking, that sort of simple little story around pretty much every single aspect of economics. If you're providing value, you need to price it properly. And then you can use some of the extra money, the, the profit that you make, to allow other people to attend for free. You can subsidize them, but you're subsidizing it from profits, not from the business. And, and that's a huge difference. And, and I think that applies to education every single bit as much. You know, I'm not, we don't have to get into a discussion about you know, the pros and cons of free education from the state, because it isn't free. And, and in very many cases, it doesn't even qualify as education. There are much better ways of providing people with choice so that quality can survive and thrive and bad actors and bad results and people and processes that don't deliver value, that they get pushed out of the market. And that's you know, the way that almost everything should be um, managed. Now, that doesn't mean to say you make everybody pay, but you should at least provide people with the means so that they can then choose what they think is the best for them with, I don't know, about or credit notes or something. You don't, by making it free, you are making it very difficult for the providers of quality to thrive over the providers of miserable quality. Yeah, I think that that's what you were referring to, a uh, Twitter thread, with, when you said the cost of free education. Um, it, it, it's huge in bad outcomes, in distortion, in misaligned incentives, and at the end of the day, in the educational transformation available to everybody. So making it free or notionally free at the point of consumption is rarely a good idea. In, in education, I believe that to be especially true. As what we're seeing a lot in the European continent, I guess, is where basically universities are very cheap, like almost free, and that then leading to the kind of stagnation, wasted resources you're talking about. But then on the other side, Anglo-Saxon world, I guess we have very high tuition fees And that's causing other like financing problems uh, for students later on. So what's, what's your view on that? That's a huge topic. Well, the idea that a degree from a university is the guarantor of success as an adult is no longer true. And as in all things, it might have been 30 years ago, but, and then it was, it was deemed politically opportune to make university education available to everybody at the same time as introducing fee structure. Because when I went to university, you know, we didn't have to pay anything. Right. We got, in fact, I was talking to somebody who was at university with me a long time ago in the early 80s. And they reminded me that we actually got paid for going to university. We got a grant and it wasn't means tested. It was just ridiculous. So we didn't pay anything. And as you say, these two systems that on the one hand, the best universities or the ones that appear to be the best are massively accelerating their pricing because of that implicit promise. If you come to us, then you are absolutely set and you'll be able to earn, you'll be right at the top and the best companies will take you and you'll have a starting salary of 200,000 and you know, you'll quickly amortize your debt that you have your investment and because of the inflation of that particular of the volume and the price that is no longer true for most so you've got a market that is completely out of sync it's over expensive it doesn't deliver return the return on investment and there has been a politically motivated drive to get as many people into university as possible so that appears to be in the sort of 
narrative of our world, the very best thing that you can do. And I can tell you, because I've looked at the numbers and I've advised my own children to do this, that an investment, a much, much, much lower investment in an apprenticeship to learn a trade, plumber or carpenter or cook or something, or mechanical engineer, promises a much higher return than a degree in sociology or journalism or whatever it is, liberal arts, or even, you know, you, you have to be very, very specialized, engineering, computer technology, medicine, law, and even in law, it's, you, know, you have to be at the top of the top to get really the sort of traction that will result in the 50, 60, 70, 100,000 dollars that you have to invest in that education plus interest coming up with a you know really good return the maths doesn't work for most people but it does for an apprenticeship you know if you learn a trade then you can set up a business as a carpenter or as a plumber or as a you know doing this sanitation and you have much less competition extremely good margins depending on how you want to measure it, a much better life, more freedom. And yet in the sort of social scale of things, having a degree in philosophy or in social sciences is considered vastly more acceptable and proper than a, an apprentice, a three-year apprenticeship in carpentry, which will then allow you to go all over the world and to be useful and to use your hands and to do good work. There's an awful lot of nonsense talked around the price of education of a university degree, just as there is an awful lot of nonsense talked around the value of a K-12 education in the form that it's delivered sort of in 90% of the schools in our Western societies. I guess we are seeing some online courses like CBCs or Evergreen courses that teach people very particular skills between monetized, do you see it as kind of an online equivalent to the apprenticeships that you mentioned? And could those be like an online solution for maybe more digital age skills? I do. And I, but I think that that approach to learning is in itself quite a privileged position. You know, that in order to think like that, lifelong learning, I've got to invest in myself, you have to have a pretty good grounding in what learning is at all. Right. And I'm horrified, you know, by th- because of the way that s- schools are organized and that education is delivered, there are very many people for whom that is not a given. So the answer is absolutely. I'm a h- huge fan of this idea of constant upgrading of skills and learning new ones and expanding your capacity but it does require a particular mindset around learning that is not automatic that's not automatic you have to learn how to learn to be like that you have to learn to want to learn and learning has to be something positive that you understand how it works and if you had a a shitty education in an awful school the only job has been to sort of get you through without you going to having to go to prison too often then that's not a foundational basis on which a lifelong learning appetite happens. I think that's a huge problem that uh, people don't have that uh, growth mindset around having to lifelong learn basically to advance. I was just going to ask, so that obviously ties back to the way that education is provided for free and that the pricing just isn't right. And But do you think there's a way that can be solved by the private sector, by pricing online courses and stuff like that? Or is that something that needs to be solved by the state? So yeah, fixing their their subsidizing model. You know, politically and economically as an entrepreneur, you will find me on the libertarian end of the scale. And the question that you have to ask yourself always is, are there absolutely specific and viable reasons why the state should provide something. If the private sector can provide it, then the private sector should provide it. 
and there should be competition and there should be experimentation and there should be different models and there should be choice as much as possible so that best practices, best results, best value for money, best incentives can be worked out in the marketplace. I, that, I fundamentally believe that. Now, there are certain aspects of public life you get torn to pieces for suggesting that the private sector might produce it. Health and education are two of the big monopolies in some countries that the state has sort of accreted to itself. And they argue till they're blue in the face. You know, they will get almost hysterical. They say, you can't take that away from us because we need to do it. Well, I would argue and always do that food, the production of food, is even more fundamentally important than education. Yeah. Food and health are at the bottom of the sort of Maslow pyramid. And food is an entirely free market. You go into a supermarket or whichever choice of supermarket you want, Costco or Walmarts or Target or any of the other hundreds or Whole Foods or whatever, the choice is endless. The price range is huge. The quality differential is massive. And there's more than enough. We can talk about that has its own problems, but there's more than enough. So if it was necessary, if the state, if it was necessary for the state to provide the basic staples of life, the bottom of the Maslow pyramid, then by all those arguments, there should be state control of food production which of course there isn't yeah. and they couldn't because it just doesn't work that way so the argument that they absolutely need to control education is nonsense and they shouldn't uh, there are other reasons for it because where else can you indoctrinate the entire youth generation and you know so the, the arguments don't hold up it's probably we don't have enough time to go into that in detail, but I genuinely believe that, as in every other market, experimentation, choice, adaptability, quality pricing, and freedom of choice should be right at the top, which makes it very difficult to produce it for free. And I guess we are seeing all of those things with the online uh, courses that are out there right now. So. Is the main challenge there, how can they compete with basically the, the government, like the free subsidized education? And uh, do you think that's something that market will work out eventually? I do. Yeah. You know, my belief is that particularly in all sorts of things happened last year and are still happening that have shown the system to be extremely fragile. We've passed the point of no return that you know, with the, the government debt being where it is, we've seen how schools have reacted, how how the teachers' unions have sort of stopped teachers going back to the classroom. You know, it, what was okay for, for health workers and for people in the supermarkets was not okay for teachers. You know, they, they, they've preferred to stay at home. You've seen huge differences in the delivery of education online, you know, with state schools being way behind in the technological delivery systems. And that's widened the privilege gap enormously. The, the children who had access to, to proper technology, the schools had invested, they were quick to ramp up, they, they adapted quickly. You know, they've been delivering education at a very high level over the past year. And other children from less privileged areas and schools or homes, because they haven't had the technology, have just been cut off and it's disgusting. I mean, it really is disgusting. And I think that the two things coming together is over burdening of the state with with debt that it can't possibly pay back overstretched in every direction and the failure of the state to really care for the children during the, the pandemic and neither both of us probably believe that if we haven't seen the end of this october is a few months away season starts again do we really believe they're not going to go back and shut everything down as soon as I don't know, a new variant pops its head up. Bullshit. You know, so the system, which is already creaking, 
is going to be just made worse and worse and worse. And the market, you know, the customers, the, the, the parents with children who want, and the children themselves need educating, and the market will come in and supply them. And once it does that, it will break that monopoly. They just won't be able to go back. It's happening at adult education level. It's galloping now. It's just, we're at the beginning of a movement of deconstructing universities, deconstructing adult education, establishing lifelong learning as a real need for adults in economically active. And that will start happening in larger areas, you know, down the past through universities and down into, into K-12 education. I'm sure, I'm sure of it. I'm sure it will happen as well. And I guess tying back to what you were saying in the, in the beginning, I, as a course creator or as a platform creator, have to, have to treat it as, as a business. So I have to be profitable first. But then the argument by people saying education should be free used is then you don't reach people in developing countries who would benefit most from learning skills like programming. And basically, if they learn to program, they could provide their family with a, a living wage. And so do you think that this business model you mentioned initially, where you are profitable first and then use the proceeds to offer that to like people in developing countries, etc.? Is that, is that like the way to go? Yes, it's one way to go. But you, firstly, I mean, that's of the pro bono approach, but that's also denying that these countries and entrepreneur, educational entrepreneurs in those countries will not find their own ways of delivering minimum necessary educational product, possibly in partnership with sort of wealthier creators in, in other countries to find the right price point for delivering and the right environment for delivering that minimum education to their own citizens. So I, I'm, I'm very hesitant in saying, you know, we need to solve Africa's problems for it because I know enough entrepreneurs in, in Africa who absolutely hate that. You know, what do they say, we are also businesses. You know, it's not as if, if you know, there are millions of people there who have, don't have two pennies to rub together. They also make choices and they also want to make investments and they also want to invest in their future. And I think it's quite arrogant of us to assume that we know better how to solve their problems. It's just a bad narrative and I don't believe it for one second. Mm. You know, we've got enough to do to solve our own problems and work in partnerships and there are all sorts of different ways of helping an entrepreneur. If you've got a successful course and you think that that might be applicable to him in Rwanda or in Nigeria or wherever, then you know, if, if he or she will reach out to you and you can say, okay, we'll do a deal and I'll give you licensing for free for the first year until you get up and running and then we'll have a different model. We've got to do a business deal and not a charity deal. I like it a lot. And I guess you're, you're absolutely right. The market in those countries will sort it out eventually. It will. Well. Yeah, it will. Markets do. That's what they're there for. I, I have to jump on another call All right. at 16, 16.30. I don't know whether you want to wrap this up or continue this at another time. I think there was a lot of uh, great stuff in there. I mean, one quick question I, I would like to touch up. If you have one minute, it's like parity pricing is quite a big thing now with online courses. So basically, like, what are, is that a, a way to solve it or is that distorting the market as well? It, basically, the, providing a high value course to somebody in, like, with, with lower income uh, at a lower price. So using parity pricing, like regional, regionally different prices. Well, yes, is the answer. You, you, if, you can, if your model will, will sustain the transparency of different prices for different times, regions, people, ethnicities, however you want to model that, if your business will can sustain that sort of transparency, and then there are no rules for what's right or what's wrong. It's just what works. If it doesn't, if you know that you're providing something of a certain value, and you say that 10% of every course is going into a scholarship fund that will allow us to give 100%, 50%, or 20% scholarships to people who apply, then you've probably got the best model. And then you can have a, a, I don't know, a little foundation 
that you set up that doesn't cost very much set up a foundation that whose primary job is to collect money that you know you save 10 percent of all our profits are going to go into this foundation and the foundation will be looking for other sources of income in order to support the scholarships for the suite of courses that i'm offering i mean there are all sorts of different ways of doing it but making it transparent is a good idea definitely and maybe we can do another one at some point um, love to yeah i won't hold you up any longer um thank so you very yeah. much Tom. and oh, by the way and, andrew andrew barry says hi oh hello andrew <laughs> okay take care all Bye. right thank you steven see ya